Hi, it's Glenn Magnus now here with Larry Seisler, and we're going to talk some politics. Uh, Larry, since we spoke for the last newsletter, we've seen an insurrection, an impeachment, and an inauguration. Are we maybe at a point where things may start to slow down so we can get some degree of normalcy? <laughs> well, one would one would think uh, that they're going to slow down, and I think that that's the uh, the promise of the of the Biden presidency is that there's going to be a sense of stability and almost boredom. Politics is going to be on the minds or uh, permeate every part of uh, of our lives. That um, the discussion is going to be uh, more about getting vaccinated, um, getting through COVID, and returning uh, to a normal life. Well, we still are where we are. And the New York Times did break a story Sunday saying that Pennsylvania Congressman Scott Perry played a key role in Trump's plot to oust the acting attorney general and replace him with somebody more willing to overturn the election. What political fallout, if any, do you expect Perry to face for this? Well, I actually wrote an op-ed yesterday at halftime of one of the football games um, about it, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be posted on the uh, Penn Live uh, website sometime this week. Great. Um, but for Perry, I mean, he's in a relatively safe district. I mean, he's had two uh, very credible challenges in the last two cycles. And even though the elections were close, he was able to to win comfortably. So I don't think that there is any fallout for him in in his district. It it may preempt him if he was thinking about running um, statewide. And, you know, it's probably also going to uh, cut in, into his into his fundraising. But, you know, he can probably stay there, um, you know, as long as he wants, as long as the district is in its current configuration. Do you think there'll be any blowback from colleagues? No. <laughs> you mean the, the Democrats <laughs> call for him to resign and he ignores them and the Republicans are afraid to say anything. So, OK, could this revelation, the, um, the, the, the whole story that the Times published or others to come? change the calculus in the Senate for impeachment? Or do you think that that's kind of baked in at this point? I think it's sort of baked in. I mean, today, and I know we're doing this for later, you saw that Senator Portman from Ohio uh, is not going to run for reelection. That tells me he's going to vote. He's going to vote to convict. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't think that they're, you know, you, you can you can see it already um, that these senators are trying to say first, they're trying to say, well, you know, you can't have a trial for somebody who's already left office. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the first line. So I don't, I don't really see, I, I don't see how they're going to get to the 17 votes that they're going to need. Let me move it uh, one step down the road then. If uh, election 2020 is over, which means we're now headed toward 2022, do you expect what happened on January 6th and maybe the way Congress people voted on certifying the election or what they've said subsequently. Do you expect any of that to have a footprint headed forward? Well, sure. For instance, I think, let's say Pennsylvania. Um, my guess that if any of those members of Congress who voted um, no on the electoral votes for Pennsylvania and voted no on impeachment, that if they wanted to run for statewide office, even though they got through a primary, I do not think they could win a general election with with those votes. I think mm -hmm. that they that they are tainted. And the same may be true if any members of the General Assembly um, who who signed the letter that went to Congress asking them to disregard um, the Pennsylvania count, if any of them ran statewide and if for some reason got Republican primary, I don't think that they could be elected. So I think that those votes are going to be um, a scarlet letter uh, when it comes to general elections. Um, okay, well, that gets to an issue that is kind of on the on the burner that uh, maybe relates to that, which is mail-in voting and a sense that that could change. What do you think is the future of mail-in voting in the state? Um, I think mail-in voting um, worked. I think it worked. It worked very well, um, but it worked um, so well that even though the Republicans um, were proponents of it, I think that they are going to um, try to to dial it to dial it back. 
and to, you know, get rid of, um, you know, no excuse, you know, no excuse um, um, absentee, absentee voting, you know, whether they can, I don't know, but, you know, they're, they're going to keep trying to come up with excuses for their original, you know, support, you know, of, you know, of the legislation. So I think it's, I think it's going to be a real fight, but, but I also think it's very difficult to take something away after it's already been given. Mm -hmm. And clearly popular. Yeah, obviously. Now, again, it may have been more popular in a presidential election and during COVID than it will be in a regular election and when people are vaccinated and it's safer to go out. Mm -hmm. Well, the next election is 2022. Um, there are two well, actually, actually, the next election is 2021. You have, okay. you have the off-year elections. Well, then, true. You know, listen, you have a mayor's, you have a mayor's race in Pittsburgh. You have a DA and controller's race in uh, Philadelphia. You have um, races uh, in the counties and you have statewide judicial elections. That is true. And Shimon, me, are any of those at this point, are you looking at any of those to see interest stirred up, uh, early jockeying candidates? Oh, no, you already have people who are running for all those. And I think that the Supreme Court, you know, Supreme Court race in the state, um, because of significance the Pennsylvania Supreme Court played in this past election, I think that there's going to be a lot of interest in it. And I think the, uh, you know, the Republicans are going to redouble their efforts um, to try to win these judicial races. Okay. 2022 is when the governor, uh, the governor's seat is up and one of the U.S. Senate seats in Pennsylvania I know there's already been some early jockeying. I just want to briefly discuss, so starting with the governor on the Democratic side, um, do you see currently anybody on the horizon who could give Josh Shapiro serious competition? No, no. I mean, I think you'll have somebody throw their name on the ballot. You know, somebody probably, you know, coming, you know, from the, uh, you know, from the, the left of the Democratic Party. You know, I just don't see anybody who can who can beat them. On the Republican side for that, I know Lou Barletta has talked about running again, um, and we discussed this a couple of months ago, uh, but let's, let's group those two seats together. Uh, Republicans who are or should be considering a statewide run for either of those seats? Oh, I th you, there's just going to be so many. It, it would be really difficult to name them. You know, everybody, you know, we talked about Barletta, but then you have this Senator Mastriano who's become, you know, this Trump whisperer. You have uh, Paul Mango, who ran for governor in the primary um, four years ago. You have Bill McSwain, the uh, the U.S. attorney, um, you know, from from the Eastern District. You have uh, Jeff Bartos, um, who ran for lieutenant governor uh, with Scott Wagner um, four years ago, um, who could who could run. Ken Braithwaite is another one. Um, Ken uh, just left as Secretary of the Navy, um, you know, under, you know, under uh, in the Trump administration. So there's a lot of people. And then um, you have Sen uh, Senator Barlotta from, um, you know, from Washington County, um, you know, because I think there's going to be some women who are going to want to run. So I think you have a lot of people who are going to be looking at those two seats. Any other Republican gubernatorial candidates you see out there? Well, Dan Hilferty, um, who's the former uh, CEO of uh, Independence Blue Cross, um, there was an article about uh, him having interest in the governorship. Uh, one more I want to cover, which is the uh, Democratic candidates, potential candidates uh, for the Senate seat. Mm -hmm. I see John Fetterman every morning on my Twitter uh, making a run. He announced he's quickly raised, I think, $1.1 mm -hmm. at last count. Is, uh, is he the early front runner here? No, I don't think so. I think it's difficult for somebody from um, Western Pennsylvania. Um, if there are credible candidates uh, from Philadelphia, you know, or the Southeast. So um, I think that's, I think he's out there early, um, but I don't think it necessarily makes, makes him, makes him the front runner. The race is obviously coming at a time when the Senate is expected to be 50-50. Mm -hmm. And um, these races, the candidate's going to have to raise, I'm guessing, tens of millions of dollars to run. 
Um, do you see this race as kind of an enormous swing state, $100 million? No, no, this will be – Pennsylvania will be one of the most expensive races, if not the most expensive race in the country because, you know, the, Republican, the Republicans have to um, defend the seat. Um, it's a true, it's a true toss-up um, battleground state. So um, you know, whoever is the Democratic nominee or the Republican nominee, um, they are not going to lack, you know, they're not going to lack the funds to run a campaign. It's going to be a fun one to watch.